Yep. Technically. Technically. All right. Let me give you a homework assignment to work on. Oh my God. <laughs> Holy cow. I have to write, read the syllabus. What? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What's the syllabus say? I think it says every Wednesday when you get homework. Oh, does it? Yes, it's over. So it will never get homework? That's what I heard. Is it the fourth or the fifth? No, it's the fifth. I just, I have things to do the fourth and the sixth. There you go. I don't know. It's on right there. Oh, it's on six problems. Yeah. Oh, wait. With no, like wait. Parts. There's, two, there's two more problems. Hold on. Here it is. Right in homework. We'll be assigned on Wednesdays. Then we'll be doing the following Wednesdays. Hey, look at that. Wow, you are <laughs> you're just so helpful. Thank you. You're Thanks, Chelsea. <laughs> so it's due next Wednesday. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I see it. Yeah, Do you want the you. date? Okay. No, I know. <laughs> Smart ass. <laughs> yeah. Listen, it's my birthday, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thanks. <laughs> also, I got my new license today. My face looks like a basketball. My head is shaped like a basketball. <laughs> I'm embarrassed for myself. Um, in Illinois, if you turn 21, you need to get a new one because it'll say under 21 on it. Yeah. It, 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 I know it changes, but like, do you have to actually go there? Because, like, in trade, like, I think I'm like, going to do like the renewal thing for my gold one. And they just use my same picture. Oh, no, that is what you're going to do. Yeah. It's 90 degrees rotated. Yeah. I think it'd be over. I need to hold it. That's the other homework. Yeah, the sheet that I just gave you is the other two problems that are also due. <laughs> So 25.4 and whatever it was, 25.4 and 25.18. Dr. Joe, you know I'm bothering me? Me? Yes. You called it. You were so smart. I know. <laughs> you didn't have to tell me, you know why? Because I'm so smart. <laughs> I don't like how 25.4 is greater than 25.18, but 25.18 is after. It should be oval. Oh, you mean like a decimal? Oh, yeah. oh got it. Now that's going to bug me forever. Thanks, Grace. <laughs> Way to go, Grace. All right. What? You didn't get it done? No. What have you been doing? Homework. Wait. <laughs> I told you. So, you're also in your algebra. Oh, you're going to go radio. So, we're all the same time. I think everyone's ready to go, but Michael. That's not true. I'm ready to go. I'm not ready to go. Well, that's on your. You went to avoid that. That's your yeah. Show up on time. That does not. No. Yeah. No, it's it's right. Show up on time, and then you won't have to call. Yeah. 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 What's free time? It doesn't exist. I, I understand. Huh? All right. I get it. Kevin, you're going to want this. Yep. Morgan, did you get the notes for history? All right. So, are there questions yeah. before we get going? Yeah, because you. All right, so let's finish up this example that we started last time and then get into let's do a few more examples of this. Uh, I'll talk about one more method of finding estimators by based on samples. And then for Friday, I'll have another video for you to watch uh, that will start into section 6.2. So we're supposed to watch it for So Friday. not yes. only do we have all of that homework, but now we have it's like eight minutes. It's I'm just I know. I don't know.
That, that, that phrase is whining. It's fine. That is my job. The whine? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And to annoy you. Yeah. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> All right. So let's let's finish this problem off. We didn't get it yet. What's that? The beta. Beta. Yeah. Is the video up there already? No. I gotta post it. Do you know what it's going to be called? Confidence interval. Mm -hmm. I will also. I'm also going to post videos for two more problems of examples with uh, just examples. You don't have to. You don't have to watch them if you don't want to. It's just examples of how to do maximum likelihood estimator problems like we're doing here. Okay. So yes, Grace. Will we be able to do all of the more problems that we Yeah. Uh, yes. Should be able to. Yeah. Okay. okay, so to finish this off, we did this last time where we came up with a likelihood function. I am recording, right? I think so. I'm going to pretend like I am. What? Yes, it's going. What, what did you say, Sam? I'm sorry. I said, why do you have a groove musical? That's the icon. Oh, that's what it is, yes. All right. So last time we came up with the likelihood function by doing the product of the PDFs evaluated for all of the pieces of your random sample for every uh, data point that you have in your sample. You're trying to figure out what beta is to maximize that product. The idea again behind doing the product comes from just doing the and probability idea, right? Now again, that's not what we are getting from a continuous distribution, but it's the concept that we use for doing uh, finding a probability of x1 happened and x2 happened and x3 happened and so on down the line, right? The x of i's are all independent. If you were doing, if this were a discrete distribution, you would calculate the likelihood of a probability by just figuring out the individual probability and multiplying them together, okay? So that's where this concept's coming from. Multiplying the PDF, evaluated at your data points, and multiplying them together. We want that likelihood function to be as big as possible. Right? Based on the sample, what's the maximum likelihood that a parameter is what it is? That's the idea. Alright? So all we did here was just plug in the PDF with the X and I's in. We said that sucks to try to differentiate. This is a big long product, right? So instead of maximizing, in, in some problems actually, you'll come up with a function that's easily enough maximized without having to do the wrong. Okay. So you wouldn't necessarily need to do that. But in this case, since we're doing it just from one to n, I don't have the n is not given to me as say two, for example. If it were just n was two, you would just probably just do the derivative at that point, right? Multiply the two together and do the derivative. So to help us out, we do the log, and the log changes products into sums. It's a lot easier to differentiate. It also splits things into pieces that don't matter. We're differentiating this with respect to beta, so these pieces here that don't have betas in them, I don't need to worry about. They just go away when we take the derivative. Right? So it really does simplify things at this stage. So at this stage, we took the derivative, and now we need to solve. So let's do that real quick. I didn't have time to do it last time. So uh, I'm going to move, I'll distribute the, the summation over the sum, and I'm going to move the thing on the left to the right, just so that I'll make it positive. So we'll have the summation of the 2 x of i squared over beta cubed is equal to the summation of the 2 over betas. And after this problem, I'm going to stop writing the I still can't make a beta. I'm going to stop writing the indices on here because it's annoying. All right. So again, we want to, we're solving this for setting it equal to zero because we're trying to maximize. We're trying to find the critical value or values depending on the context of the problem. Typically, you're going to get one value that makes sense. And it's going to be a maximum. If there's any question, you should always check it, so I'll mention that in a second. But let's figure out these sums. Any i's in here? No. So the summation of this is just going to be what? 
you know, 2n over beta, right? Or 2 over beta times n. Over here, we can pull out the 2 over beta cubed and just leave, leave us with an x sub i squared there. We agree? Yeah. Okay. So now if we move things around, we can get beta squared on the right and this 1 over n times the sum of the x sub i's squared. Yes. Okay. And then to find beta, I would need to take the square root. Usually when we take the square root, we would get plus or minus, but let's check the context of the problem real quick and see if a minus even makes sense. Here's your PDF. Uh, it doesn't tell you what the support is, but I can tell you for y mole distribution, it's x has to be positive. And in particular, I'm squaring beta anyway in both cases, all right? So I don't need to worry about plus or minus, but it will be positive. I need a positive thing anyway, there anyway. But notice I already have what beta squared needs to be, and that's what we're trying to estimate anyway. But the beta here would be the square root of this thing. Making the beta negative doesn't do anything to the problem. So far, so good? All right, so this should be our maximum likelihood estimator. We would make sure, to make sure that this really is a maximum in general, I would need to take a second derivative and see that it's <laughs> negative. When I plug in that particular value, yes, Grace. It's the parameter. It's the parameter we're trying to find. Yeah, it's it won't quite be the means just way the problem's set up, but in general, it's just a parameter. It's an adjustment for the distribution to try to fit whatever data is popping up. If I remember correctly, the Weibull distribution does a little bit better uh, than an exponential distribution <coughs> does for modeling uh, tail, things that tail off like life, lifetime. Exponential distribution is not a good uh, estimate for, or not a good model for lifetimes once you get closer to the death time. Because remember for exponential distribution, if I have if I know that I've lived 70 years, the probability that I would live another 10 years is the same as I lived the first 10 years of my life, which is not true in general. Given that I've lived given that I've lived 70 years, given that I have lived 70 years, the probability that I lived to 80 would be the same as the probability that I lived from zero to ten years, which for a lifetime is just not true. So the Weibull distribution cuts off the tail faster than an exponential distribution does to try to model lifetimes better. And what your beta would be doing is trying to fit the data to what uh, to fit your distribution to what the data that tells you what it would be. Yeah, same for one of the exponential that one of the Weibull. Yeah, that's a perfectly fine model for things that will uh, uh, model like Radioactive decay, for example, you're doing probably the most things, and it's a perfectly fine uh, estimate for things that aren't close to it when things typically die. So, it's just when for people, it's not a good model for people, but for um, other things, and well, especially if you're not worried about what's going on near death, if you're just worried about what's going on in the middle, then it's perfectly fine. It's just that if you're worried about well, insurance companies would be worried about death if they're in life insurance. So you want to make sure that you've got <coughs> models that model appropriately for people life time. So, that's fine. so like we have this parameter and so then like your x values you plug in, like is that like under this parameter like you find what beta is, those x values will have the maximum like No, so we don't know what beta is to start with. We're trying to use the x sub i's that we have to estimate a beta to help me get a probability distribution that I could use to model in general. So if I'm trying to, if I'm trying, for example, if we think about doing this for, uh, <laughs> if you think about doing this for life insurance in particular, so 
I've got a model for, I've got a sampling of people that I know what has happened to them. You know, oh, it doesn't even matter if it's life insurance, just whatever you're in general. I've got lifetimes of people. Say. I know that typically the wide, this particular distribution gives me a good idea of how to model lifetimes of people. But for this particular set of people, maybe they are smokers. The beta would change based on if they're smokers, if they're non-smokers, or if they have a history of cancer in their family, or those kinds of things, right? So I've got different distributions that need to be set up for different uh, categories of people. So I would take a sample of the people, see how long they lived, and then find my beta based on that sample and then use my probability distribution to try to model the whole population of those types of people. But again, I only have a piece of it. I don't, I don't get the information for the entire population at once. I only get a piece of it because I've only got a sample, especially if the people haven't been born yet. I'm trying to do this for future people or future customers. So people, people who haven't been born or people who haven't come to my company yet, if I'm trying to do this for future customers, I certainly don't have that data at all. So I'm trying to do this inference on what my distribution should look like based on the sample that I have. So I'm trying to maximize my chances that I have a good model based on that particular sample. So that's the idea. Now I'm using people example, but it could be the same thing with I've manufactured a component for a computer this way and I do a sample for how long that component lasts under certain conditions. Maybe I'm doing testing for uh, how well the, the uh, component performs in the cold because uh, scientists take it on an Arctic expedition. Maybe I need to check to see how well it performs if there are power surges. Those kind of things, right? So we're testing the component over and over and over again, but I don't know what is going to happen for all components, because if I test all my components until they blow up, I don't have any components to sell, right? So if I want to try to model what's going to happen with my manufacturing process, then I'm going to use the sample to try to figure out what the parameter should be to model it. So that's what we're doing here, to try to use a sample to give us a model to be able to make other types of predictions going forward. So that's the idea. So, but you can do this for insurance, you can do it for engineering, you can do it for um, biology, if you're trying to model different populations based on whatever for, uh, characteristics the population has. Whatever you might want to try to model, this is the kind of thing, if you're doing it from a probabilistic standpoint. Um, anything you do in physical chemistry with where electrons might be in orbiting an atom, for example, is you have to do probability. So any of these things, are those kind of ideas. Anyway, um, where was I? <laughs> all right, so okay. all right, so we could test whether or not this is the maximum, taking a second derivative and plugging in that value in for beta, right, and seeing that it's negative. Uh, in this case, if I took the second derivative, that's going to turn out to be positive, that'll turn out to be negative, but um, if you plug in the value here, you should get some cancellation that makes things nicer, and you, know, you could check that it really is negative, it really is the maximum likelihood in that case. In most cases, it will be the maximum. Uh, we'll, we'll see an example here in a little bit where it may not be the maximum, well, we may have to figure out what the maximum likelihood estimator is in a different fashion. All right, the, was the process of getting to here okay? I mean, I know we split it over two so class that, periods. Is that just like the answer? Well, this is, so this we would, we would, we call this, we usually refer to it as beta hat, okay? So this beta hat equal to one over n summation of x sub i squared is the maximum likelihood estimator. for beta. Now in this problem, this specific problem, I have to scroll back up, it gave you a sample of five observations and it asked to calculate the maximum likelihood estimate. So for this particular problem, I would take these five values and I would plug it into the formula. 
So the five values, 2.5, 7.5, 12 .5. Let's See if I remember the other ones, 16 and 17.5. Okay. Those are the five values that we have. So these are your X sub I's, right? So your, if for this particular one, your beta hat would be the square root of a fifth times the sum of the squares here. Whatever that turns out to be. So then in this case, we would actually get a value. Yeah, Chelsea? That's an X of I. That's an X of I. Yeah, sorry. That's a... Yeah. Yep. Yeah, same. So with the B hat, does it mean it's proportionality estimate? No, it just means it's a, it's an estimate of a value. So B beta is representing the parameter, so beta has a specific value that we're going to use for beta. It actually means that it's going to make sure it doesn't get, catch a cold when it goes outside, but it still puts its hat on. <laughs> I'm going to draw a different hat. You're going to draw, you draw whatever you want. <laughs> I'm going to draw like one of those 2D baseballs. You're going to give it a ski mask is what you're going to end up doing. <laughs> I'm going to draw it. <laughs> so you draw it around like this and you know. Cool. <laughs> I'm going to steal your application. Yeah. Anyway, this one okay? Let's do another one. So we've done exactly one example here. So let's do another one. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it is. It's just because you can tell how it's been in disguise there, but that's all right. I'm not worried about whether or not it's in disguise. All right. One of the reasons, this is taken from one of the ITRL review manuals. One of the reasons why it says this is because if for an exponential, think about it this way. <clears throat> What's the mean of the exponential distribution? It's just theta, right? So if you want a maximum likelihood estimator based on a sample, what do you think you're going to do to the sample to estimate theta? Take the mean. Yeah, exactly. The mean of an exponential distribution is theta. So if I want the maximum likelihood estimate for an exponential distribution from a sample, I'm going to use the mean of the sample. Because most likely, the theta is the mean of the sample. You can check it, but that makes intuitively that would make sense, right? If I know what if I know the mean of the distribution is theta, and I want to estimate theta from a sample, I want to take the mean of the sample because it should be the mean of the sample it should be close to the mean of the distribution. So I'm going to use that for my sample uh, for my maximum likelihood distribution or uh, estimator. That's why it says if you recognize this as an exponential in disguise, you can do it quicker without having to do what we're going to do here in a second. But we're, I just want to do this from the, what the PDF is. I don't care about the whole setup of the problem. All I care about is the PDF. I want to use this to get, do the maximum likelihood estimator. Okay. So what, would it, what do we set up first? Is it just like the other one? Yeah. It's exactly like the other one. That's why I wanted to do another example, because we've done one. <laughs> we've done one example. Okay, so the likelihood function of theta, right? Well, what's in my what's in the problem? So it changes. Well, it depends on what parameter you're trying to find. The letter really doesn't matter. You can make a I could. The only time the letter really matters is if you've got two of them you're trying to do, which we will talk about. Okay. All right. This is equal to what? The product. product of the f of x sub i given the theta, right? Essentially. Right. And again, I'm not going to write the indices because I'm lazy. So this is log of theta, theta to the negative x sub i, right? Do we? Sure. Why not? Are we going to do the next log and the log? Yeah. Why wouldn't we? 
I don't want to differentiate that without taking a natural log, do you? You just plug in the x of i for where the x is, yeah. All right, so now we want to do the natural log. What's the change the product into? Sum. Sum. So I got to take the log of each piece and add them. So this will be log of log of theta, and then it'll be minus x of i log theta. Why does the log turn the product? Why does a log turn a product into a sum? Yeah. What does logarithm mean? <laughs> this one word starts with an E. What is a logarithm? It's, it's an exponent. Yeah, a logarithm is an exponent. What do you do when you multiply? What do you do with exponents when you multiply? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I could write down a proof for you, but that's probably the easiest way to think about it. Okay. Yeah, log logarithms are ways to keep track of exponents. When you multiply, you add exponents. So that's why you add logs. That's why logs turn products into sums. But I can prove it right now if you want to see it. No. Okay, I can make you prove it if you want. Okay. What do we do now? Okay. What do you get? Um, one natural log of one over theta. Well, one over theta. One over theta. Thank you. <laughs> Chain rule, right? Oh, yeah. Derivative of the natural log is 1 over the inside times the derivative of the inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I knew you knew that. And the second part? Okay. Now, what do we want to do with this? Break it up. Well, yeah, we will, but in general, what do we want to do with this derivative? Ah, set it equal to 0 and solve, right? Yeah. Oh, are we solving for theta? Yes, we're solving for theta. Yeah. And then put the x of i, 1 over theta, to the other side. Work the magic. Work the magic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's the question again? Sorry. I took, I distributed the sum over and then moved it. So I, I, I did the. I did. Oh, th this thing is this. That's what. <laughs> yep. All right. What's the left hand side equal to? Okay. And then what can I do on the right hand side? Careful. This is changing. <clears throat> this has an I in it. So all I can do is pull the one over theta out, right? Uh, <laughs> so this, this doesn't have any I's in it, right? So I'm just adding it to itself n times. Yep. Bless you. Bless you. Oh, and then we move some stuff around. Move some stuff around. So Cancel let's. The theta at the bottom. Oh yeah, that's that's good shout. Cancel the thetas. <laughs> what? Yeah. And yep. Then yeah, and then do e. Um, what is this here? I mean, it's written a little bit differently, but what is this? Definitely. 
Yeah, it's the it's the, the reciprocal of the mean, right? Oh. Uh, not negative. I'm sorry. Oop. One over. Sorry, that's what I meant. I think it's a hat too because it's the maximum likelihood estimator. Yep. Why can we do what? Well, the sum of x of i over n would be the mean. So it's just the reciprocal. Right? If this were upside down, it would be the mean. Yeah, so I'm just saying it's the reciprocal of the mean. Just to write it a little bit more simply. That's all I'm saying. What is the hat? It means it's the maximum likelihood estimator. It means that it means that it's a specific value. We're we're using the we're using the value that we're coming up with to give us an estimate for that value. And in statistics, when you're using that for an estimate, you use the hat typically. Let's see that in regression as well. Like for example, you do your um, what, uh, least squares line. You know, y hat. Because you're using the y hat that you get estimates based on the line versus what is the hat? The p hat proportionality. Yeah, you have an estimate for Same thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's what you're using as an estimate. And what we call, what we refer to these things as, are point estimates. We refer to because we're using a specific value to estimate what the parameter is. That's a point estimate. <laughs> What we're going to be concentrating on for the rest of the chapter after we're done with this section, which will probably be sometime in March, the way this is going. When we're done with this section, we'll be talking about interval estimation, coming up with the range of values that's likely to contain the parameter that we're interested in. So right now we're doing point estimates. All right? And what we're trying to do is give us a point that has the best chance of being the parameter. That we're looking for. That's the idea. Yeah, same. So for this problem, I was knowing that it's an exponential distribution to speed up. Because you can use uh, the information that they have. Notice that if it, if this were an exponential function, you would use the theta is equal to the mean, but things are reciprocated here, so you would use one over the mean. That's what how it speeds it up. It's a transformation of the the exponential distribution, so you can do a transformation of the maximum likelihood estimator to get it there. That's where it comes from. Right. We okay with that? All right. Let's do a weird one, because that's what we do. Oops, not that. That's for later. All right. So let's say we have a uniform distribution So let's say we have a random sample taken from a uniform on 0 to theta so I don't know what theta is. I know it starts at zero, but it ends at theta. And we want to find the maximum likelihood estimate for theta. Yeah, actually. No. I guess I don't think so. Might be an example of the book, but it's definitely not. Uh, is it a question? No. Nope. I don't think it is. It's a it's a standard example. I just don't think it's in the book because it's weird. It's a, but it's a standard weird one. But it's going to illustrate a couple of different things for me. Yes. It's probably really good thought in this it's probably, yes. Again? But you already took it. Yeah, but I have to do it. <laughs> All right. 
Okay, so this random sample is taken from a uniform distribution. I know it's uniform, but and I know that my lower bound is zero, but I don't know what the upper bound is for the domain, what for the support. So we want to try to get an estimate, a maximum likelihood estimate for what the theta needs to be based on the sample. Okay. So we're going to set it up the same way. That's our definition of our likelihood function, right? We take the product of our PDF evaluated at each point in the random sample. Well, what is the PDF for a uniform distribution? Well, this is continuous, so. Okay, what's B and A? Theta is zero, so it's just one over theta, right? I don't think it's one over zero. That would be bad. <laughs> All right. So no matter what I have for, no matter what I have for my x of i, I get one over theta, right? <laughs> That's it. There's no x's in it. Okay. Uh oh. Okay. In fact, what is if the nice do a product of one over theta? This is just this is theta to the minus n, isn't it? I'm multiplying one over theta by itself n times, right? So it's theta to the negative n. So the derivative, in this case I'll just differentiate, I don't even bother with a log. What is the derivative? Okay, good. All right. Well, theta here is certainly positive, right? Without a doubt. Theta is positive, correct? Okay. Theta is positive, so theta to the negative n minus 1 is going to be positive no matter what times a negative n. It's negative. This is negative. Oops. Less than zero, right? Which tells you what about the original function? There is the word I'm looking for. That's what derivative tells you, right? I wasn't thinking of. I really thought you had something else. That's what it tells us about the original function, right? Tells us that it's decreasing. So the likelihood function is a decreasing function, but we want the likelihood function to be as big as possible. All right? Okay. Now let's think about it. We've got two things going on. I need the likelihood function to be as big as possible, but it's decreasing. So what does that tell me I want to do with my theta? Make it as small as possible, right? Because it's the reciprocal, correct? So to make the likelihood function to be as big as possible, I need theta to be as small as possible. Right? That's thing one that we need to think about. Okay. Thing two that we need to think about is how does theta correspond to the random sample? Where do your x1 out to xn come up come from? From the, yeah, the uniform from zero to theta, right? You agree? Okay. So what does that tell you that you that your x1 to xn have, is numbers, what do they have to be in between? Zero and theta, right? Whatever they happen to be, they have to be between zero and theta, right? I, but, I, but they have to be between zero and theta. So can I use a value for theta that's less than one of your x of i's? No, because x of i, uh, each x of i has to be less than or equal to theta, right? Okay. So I want my theta to be as small as possible, right? But I still want my random sample to come from zero to theta. So based on the random sample, how can I pick my theta and still have my random sample, I want my theta to be as small as possible, 
So my random sample will still come from uh, uh, from zero to theta. What should I use based on the sample? What should I use for theta? The biggest. Yeah. No, the biggest thing in the sample. Exactly. So let's write this down so we have it in the notes. All right. So this means we want theta to be as small as possible. The function's decreasing, right? So I need my theta to be as small as possible to make the likelihood function as big as possible, right? And we need theta to be larger, at least as big, I should say, as the largest x sub i. I should say it's bigger than all the, it's at least as big as all of the x sub i, right? It needs to be, it has to be as, at least that big, right? Your x, each of your x sub i's must be less than or equal to theta because the random sample came from a uniform zero to theta, right? Right? Okay. So your each your your x of i's all have to be less than or equal to theta. But we also want to pick theta to be as small as we can possibly get. But there's a, a, a stopping point. We can't make it get any smaller. Based on the sample that we have, the smallest we can make theta is the biggest thing in the sample. That satisfies both of those conditions, right? As small as possible, but at least as big as the largest, right? So our theta hat here will be the maximum of the x1, the x2, not the xn. Because each of your x sub i's had to come from the interval from 0 to theta. So I can't make my theta less than one of the x sub i's. That's because of the interval that it comes from. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So I'm not going to go through a lot of... I, well, you can go through this. We talked last semester about how to come up with the PDF for the maximum and what the expected value of the maximum is in general. You can show that if I think now if I think of my theta hat as a random variable itself, so as the sample changes, the theta hat will change. And look at the distribution of the theta hats. If I look at the expected value of the theta hats, you would like this to be theta, right? I would like the expected value of theta hat to be theta, but it's not, unfortunately. It is, <laughs> I think it's in, what is it? It's in, I think it's in minus one. Uh, I might be wrong on this. It's a multiple of theta. It depends on the n. I think it's in, it could be in plus one over n. Uh, it's, it's that or it's. Yeah, I think it's that. It has to be less than theta. Well, think about why it needs to be less than theta. This is a continuous distribution. Would you expect to hit theta with any particular value out of your random sample? No. No. Then now the bigger that your sample gets, the more likely you are to get one of them that's close to theta, right? But in general, you're never going to get theta, which is why I can't get, that's why the expected value isn't quite theta. Okay. So this particular, this particular estimator for theta is what we refer to as bias. It depends on what the n is. Okay. So this is an example of a biased estimator 
for theta. So, what this saying is essentially that if the string is here is the max that random sample mm -hmm. if you the maximum like going after infinity, mm -hmm. then when it's enough, then you would get theta. Yep. Right. If it, yeah. So then, if you have less than that, you're going to come up with something that's not quite what theta needs to be. Right. If you actually want to get where the expected value represented is theta, you would need to multiply the S with the A by the reciprocal. The reciprocal, the expected value comes out to be what you would want. Is that thing we find here? Like the limit of the function We will, if you actually want to figure out something that's closer to theta, a uh, good estimate for theta, you would take whatever estimate you get, and then you would multiply by the reciprocal. So the overall. However, the long term, then you would get an unbiased, what's referred to as unbiased estimate for theta. So, this is biased estimators. Sometimes you have to use them, and some, but it, usually you want to try to make them unbiased, make sure that there is not, it, we want to make it as sample independent as we can, right? Right? And what this says is that the estimator, that, or the expected value of the estimator that we're using, depends on the size of the sample, right? Now again, the bigger the sample gets, the better the estimate should be, but in general, you would rather have something that's unbiased than biased. Now this one actually is referred to as asymptotically unbiased because the bigger the n gets, the closer it gets to theta, right? Like Alex said, if you did an infinite number of these things, you would get something that looks like theta because the limit out front is one. Yes, right, right, right. Yep, that's the that's that's the actual theta that we're trying to estimate. Right. And the expected value you're saying by taking all your theta halves, you would hope to get you would hope you get theta out of it. Yeah. If you did the, the average of those things, which in this case is not quite right. And again, the reason for that is because the chances that you actually hit the right hand endpoint are zero. So the values that you get are going to be strictly less than theta all the time. So if I do this over and over and over again, I'm going to be getting things that are less than theta all the time. Now again, the bigger my sample gets, the better shot that I have to get closer and closer, but I'm not ever actually going to hit theta. That's the idea. All right. All right, we'll do more of this. Uh, we need to talk about one more concept in this section, which is the idea of finding what are called the method of moments estimators. Yeah, I'm ready. I'm, I'm nervous. Though. Why are you nervous? Just, I, just check I it. I you that one time. Ah. See, much better. <laughs> Did you ever get so it's. The unbiased just means that if you do the expected value, you'll get the the you'll get the uh, parameter you're trying to estimate. That's all unbiased means. So, for example, remember when we talked about um, our s squared was one over n minus one. That one. The reason we use the n minus one for sample variance is because when we do no, the expected not. value of s squared, we really do get sigma squared. So that's what makes it unbiased. It's actually giving me an estimate that if I do average over and over and over again, I should get the value that I'm interested in. That's unbiased. Because it, because it got an n in it. Yeah. Yeah. I only have eight. Oh. Okay. I just got another go on that.